This is the August 6, 2012 Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, may I have the Secretary do the roll call, please? Connie Yoshimura? Here. Bruce Phelps? Stacy Dean? Here. Terry Parks? Here. Dana Prude? Here. Ray Hickel? Peter Mulcahy? Here. James Ferguson? Here. Tyler Robinson? Here. Uh, thank you very much. We have seven members present. Um, there are no minutes uh, for this meeting. Uh, special order of business. Uh, Vice Chair Parks, would you please do the disclosures? Yes, Madam Chair. Commissioner Deans? No. Commissioner Pruse? No. Commissioner Robinson? Uh, yes, I would like to disclose that in the matter of case S11864-2, my company, Cook Inlet Housing Authority, has had um, interests involving a particular development in Eagle River with a petitioner, um, both in ownership share and contractual relationship. I do not have any interest, private or financial, in this particular case. Do you feel like that you can uh, participate? Yes, sir. Okay. Any, uh, any concerns from any of the commissioners on that? And then we'll ask that you participate tonight. Mr. Ferguson? In the matter of case 2012-105, um, I currently have a contract I'm managing with Enterprise Engineering. It has nothing to do with the case before us tonight. I have no financial or other interest in this case tonight. And you feel like you can participate? Yes, sir. Do we have any concerns? And we'll ask you to participate tonight, please. Commissioner McKay? Nothing, sir. I have nothing. Commissioner Ishimura? Um, yes, in the case number S11864-2, Potter Creek Development, I am the managing member and have an equity position in that LLC. So because I have a financial interest in that case, I will um, ask to be recused. And I think that's appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order, please. We do need a motion on that. A motion to, okay. to direct. Somebody want to make that motion? You want to make a motion, then I'll, I'll second for you. I motion for Connie Oshimura to not participate in case S11864-2. I'm sorry, it needs to be in the positive. Positive, and, and then, then you we have to vote. Okay. We vote down. <laughs> so I motion for Connie to participate in case S11864-2. I'll just clarify that uh, that vote was six against and one abstention, and she will not be participating. Uh, Terry, is, does, um, does, does that preclude the petitioner from, from answering questions with the development? Yes. Yeah, she would not be able to even as a petitioner. She'll have a rep. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Under C2, PNC policy on changes to the application and staff report. Um, <clears throat> we have had several discussions over the past year about voluminous amounts of material being laid on the table. And so as a result of that, um, Erica McConnell, the current planning section manager, has drafted a change in policy regarding um, uh, <clears throat> proposed policies on changes to the application staff report or conditions of approval and policy on late public comment submittal. Erica, would you like to brief us on this, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. In accordance with your direction at the July 2nd meeting, you requested that the Commission's policy change so that um, information coming from staff or the applicant was not submitted to the Commission uh, after the packet was delivered to the Commission. This did necessitate a change in the current policy um, that is 
printed on the back of the agenda. And so I drafted what I thought was the uh, will of the commission to state that um, changes will not be accepted from the staff or the applicant and public comment um, if it is submitted at the public hearing has to be uh, in limited in scope. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Ferguson. I have a question on the policy, and I recognize the policy is not in effect immediately right now, but on case 2012-105, Potter Heights, uh, there was an email exchange starting, I believe, on Friday, continuing through today. And part of that email exchange expanded to, to beyond the initial questions of the commissioner. Now, would that have been allowed if this policy was in effect? Through the chair, Mr. Ferguson, the staff finds that co communication between the staff and the petitioner continues uh, in some cases after the staff report is delivered to the commission. Uh, there are times when we get questions uh, delivered by email from the commission that causes the staff to then communicate with the applicant and, and may suggest a change. Um, so, no, that under this policy, I do not think that email would have been appropriate. Thank you. I mean, the proposed policy says, unless specifically requested by the commission. So I assume that if you got an email, you, you would answer that email? Yes. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if I wear my hat that where I find myself on the other side of, uh, of this body, and I'm in front of you, and I, and I have an experience where um, I wait until the staff report is out as a petitioner, and I find some findings in the staff report that, that maybe are surprising, and I want to try to sort of clarify those, those findings, is perhaps first a question to staff. Do you always share the findings uh, or the recommendations, the full recommendations that you're going to provide with a petitioner before you publish that staff report? I guess I'll ask that question first. To the Chair, Commissioner Robinson, it's certainly a best practice for that to happen, but in the realities of life, the workload, other sorts of things, that does not always happen. Second question, Madam Chair, um, since this is coming from the, the Commission, basically, this policy change, is, is it the will of the body then that the petitioner wait and um, sort of offer their counter opinion if they're perhaps not agreeable with one of those recommendation, recommendations or one of those conditions upon presenting beforehand or to try to resolve it? It would seem to me that we're precluding them from trying to resolve it um, prior to, to standing beho before us? Well, um, let me explain it as best we I can, and certainly there are other commissioners here with uh, opinions as well. Um, but over the past, I would say, 18 months, um, we have been subject to receiving a voluminous amount of material that has been laid on the table. And in many instances, uh, that material has been uh, relevant, but we have not had an opportunity to uh, adequately review it, which forces a postponement. So that's one issue. Um, the second issue, I guess, that I would bring up is that I consider emails and questions from the commissioner to staff to be of a confidential nature, and I don't... Uh, uh, or I would hope that those emails are not shared uh, directly to the petitioner. I think the goal is, because we're all volunteers, is that we want to see a package as complete as possible. Um, and then it's up to the petitioner and staff to make the determination as to whether or not the package is ready to come forward. Uh, Commissioner Parks. To the chair, I, I guess I have a couple comments on this. Uh, as you've, if you've made a very strong position that we get so much information that we just can't, we can't digest it all prior to the hearing. Um, I personally don't have any issues if it's a, a small change or it's, it's an issue that's being brought up to be able to explain that to us by laying it on the table. But when I get 
50 or 75 sheets and, I, and we start the, the meeting at 6.30, there's no way that I'm going to be able to read that and digest it. Uh, I, I also have been sitting on the other side where I've been a petitioner and there's information that I want to get across to the commission that is very important to me. So I'm kind of between a rock and a hard spot. I think there's a need for it. I think it's how much. And things like public comment, those kind of things, there is a deadline, and those deadlines should be held to. And if we leave them out of a package unintentionally, I certainly want that. But if it's something that they just missed the deadline, I don't think that's something that's important enough to draw in. If it was important enough for them to do it, they should do it on time. If there are typos and mistakes, I'd like to have the opportunity to see those. And if there's something that you've resolved as staff with a petitioner, I would like, like to see that, too, because I think that expedites our ability to make a decision. Um, once again, I, 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 I'm not advocating that we get this much paper every time we come in here to a meeting and have to come 20 or 30 minutes early just to read through it. But I, but I do think that we do need the opportunity to make the decision on whether we're going to look at some of the information, as long as it's short, concise, and not arguing the point. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner uh, Pruse. Yeah, I just, you know, uh, my, my uh, two cents, I guess, on this is, um, as Commissioner Robinson indicated, uh, if, if, if findings are not uh, given to the petitioner out of courtesy prior to their publication and us getting it, <clears throat> what I don't want to, what I would like not to see is the petitioner taking up valuable time of his 10 minutes um, uh, re rebutting the findings and not having a chance to do that in writing. I would much rather hear the petitioner and the project what they're trying to accomplish instead of reacting to what staff has, has come up with findings. I mean, it could, it, could, it could be typical. It could be a volleyball back and forth. The net actually is what it could be in front of here. Uh, it, it'll take time away from rebuttal. Um, mm -hmm. So I think out of courtesy, I think it starts with if the findings are given to the petitioner out of courtesy, uh, the 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 the, uh, the petitioner has the opportunity to respond in writing. We get to see that prior to the packet coming before us. I think that would be that would be appropriate. And and then the hearing would be you know the petitioner would have his ten minutes to to, uh, to state what they're doing and and uh, leave some time for rebuttal. And we wouldn't be put in a pinch. Okay. Uh, we do have uh, Margaret uh, O'Brien. You have a comment. Um, yes, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to respond to um, Mr. Robinson's comments. We do share the, um, the department report with the applicant, but not until it has gone through all the levels of review. We have at least three levels of review until it's been finally reviewed by the department and approved by the department director. It is considered draft because changes can happen all along that level of review. Therefore, if we were to prematurely show it to the petitioner and something changes, the petitioner could be caught short relying on one version which may not be the final version. The other thing that, um, so that's why it's not um, published prior to it being fully reviewed internally, because it is a department recommendation. It's not just one person's recommendation. And the other point is what we have found is that um, it is a good idea to get together with the applicant to review the conditions of approval to resolve anything that can be resolved prior to um, the public hearing. That may result in revised conditions of approval, which we can write out. And if it's far enough in advance of the meeting, we can email to the commissioners. It has occurred in the past where the commission has tried to fashion conditions approval during the public hearing, and that is an awfully difficult thing to try to do um, because it is during a public hearing under public scrutiny, and it takes a certain wording to make sure that it meets the um, needs of the applicant and that it is also worded in a way that it is enforceable and it's not subject to interpretation. So 
to not accept anything after the packet is delivered, the resolution may happen after the packet is delivered, but it is not the um, the changes to the conditions of approval may not be so onerous that the commission could not review them in advance, even after the packet is delivered. You know, Margaret, um, thank you very much. I, I think that adds a lot of clarity. If I remember specifically, there was one instance where um, a staffer had not responded in a timely manner, which created a material change in one of the cases. And I think that was in part also what prompted this. So. Um, you know, it's sort of a, a two-way street. I think what the feeling on the commission is, is that, you know, if there is something that's rel that, that we certainly do want to encourage communication, but we do want to have as complete a package as, as possible. Um, and that emails between the commission and staff are confidential. So um, what is the wish of the commission at this time? Uh, Commissioner Parks. Madam Chair, I'd like to, to make a recommendation that we um, take a look at it. I've got something that I, I would address that I think would solve some of the problem, just a language change, and give us some flexibility that, that we don't get huge amounts. And, and let me read it to the commission and see if, you, if, if we can agree upon this. The commission may reject the submittal of voluminous information or material amendments from the public at public hearing. Maps, graphics, photographs, and no more than two pages of typewritten information will be allowed. Uh, at our discretion. The Commission may choose to accept submittals or attachments. If the public uh, insists on submitting or these amendments, critical, and they are critical to the case, the Commission may, in its discretion, postpone the hearing for 30 days in order for staff and the Commission to thoroughly review the information. That would give us an opportunity to take that information and digest what we think we can digest, and if it's greater than what we think we can digest, then we should be able to postpone it. And I think that kind of answers both sides of the street. All right. Is that in the form of a motion? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Do I have a second to the motion? Uh, second, uh, motion was made by Terry Parks and seconded by Stacy Dean. Uh, Commissioner Ferguson, do you have a comment? I have a comment on the motion. I see us getting material back from staff, too. It seems to me in the past month we have gotten a lot of material back from staff, and I think that's part of the problem, and I don't believe Mr. Park's motion takes care of that half. I mean, we are a volunteer body. We all have real jobs that we do eight to five, five, six days a week. And so we're, we're trying to go through this material. And sometimes it just can get overwhelming. And we, can, we get six or nine inches of paper for some of these meetings. And then Thursday before, Wednesday before, we get another 30 pages. And I don't believe we're doing what the public wants us to do when we get overloaded. And I, I agree with Mr. Parks that, you know, we're between a rock and a hard spot, and it, it's going to take some wisdom to get to get us past that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, sometimes cases do get complicated. I do remember the Rabbit Creek Community Church case when we had competing, you know, hydrological studies and all that sort of thing. And so I think it is it is difficult. And I think what this commission really needs is you know, the courage to postpone if we are feeling that we are that we are overwhelmed with information and material, whether it comes from the petitioner or whether it comes from staff uh, and whether it comes in email or uh, as far as uh, being laid on the table. We just will have to make that decision um, one at a time. But I think this discussion has probably helped staff um, understand what um, some of our concerns are. We have a second to the motion. Ms. Dean, we haven't heard from you on this matter. Do you have any comment you'd like to make? 
Uh, the only comment I have is I try really hard to get through all the information. And even on the day of, I do try to see if I have time. Today I didn't have time to read the emails that were going back and forth. But I think everybody tries really hard to read the information. And it is really difficult when we do show up and there's a stack on the on the table. But at the same time, I feel bad for staff because they still are getting information so that it could be really relevant to what we need to see that night. So it is a quandary. Okay. Thank you. Is there an objection to Mr. Parks' motion? Seeing and hearing none, that motion passes. Thank you. Did we confuse you, Erica? <laughs> I'll have to get the specific language from the secretary. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, under moving on to the consent agenda. Uh, D1, Resolutions for Approval. Item number A, Resolution 2012-036, Related Case 2011-104. The purpose is for approval of the provisionally adopted Title 21 rewrite chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, 13, and draft chapter 14, in addition to the proposed amendments. May I have a motion, please? Ah, um, the secretary has cor corrected me that on the consent agenda is also D3 case 2012-105, Continental Auto Group. I know there's been some discussion about this in email communication. Um, is There is a motion to approve the consent agenda, including item... D, is it your intent to include item D1A as well as D3A? Or does someone want to pull any item from the agenda? You have your questions answered. Any other? All right. Then the consent agenda stand. Has, is there any objection to the consent agenda? Seeing and hearing none? that the consent agenda is approved. Thank you very much. We are now moving on to case G1, case 2012-096. The petitioner is Jerry Harmon. It is a request to rezone to R6 Suburban Residential District. The total area is 120 acres. Now, as far as... The procedure by which the public may speak at the commission at its meetings is after the staff presentation is completed on public hearing items, the chair will ask for public testimony on the issue. Two, persons who wish to testify will follow the time limits established in commission rules of procedure. A petitioners, including all his, her representatives, will have 10 minutes. Part of this time may be reserved for a rebuttal. B, representatives of groups, community councils, PTAs, et cetera, five minutes. Please indicate if you are the designated representative for a group. And C, individuals have three minutes. When your testimony is complete, you may be asked questions by the commission. You may only testify once on any issue unless questioned by the commission. An individual may have appeal rights relating to any action the Planning and Zoning Commission takes. Appeals must be filed with the clerk's office within 20 days after the Planning and Zoning Commission's final decision. Any individual may request written findings from any commission decision within seven days. May we have the staff report on case 2012-096. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a request to rezone 20.4 acres, or approximately 20.4 acres, out of a 120-acre parcel. Uh, the parcel is currently zoned PC, which stands for Planned Community District, and it's located on the south side of Eagle River Road, approximately three miles west of Eagle River Loop Road. The plan is that the 20.4 acres be rezoned into the R6 district for future subdivision for uh, single-family development. The remaining approximately 100 acres um, will have a permanent conservation easement placed across them to be managed by the Great Land Trust and will be used for Alaska's first wetlands bank. If you do have questions about the Wetlands Bank, uh, the petitioner is here and, and would be able to answer specific questions about that bank. Um, we have some special limitations proposed for the rezoning, which are agreed to by the petitioner. That is a limitation on three particular uses in order to protect the wetlands that surround this property. 
and there's an effective clause that the rezone shall not become effective until the preliminary plat is approved because at this time it is still one entire 120 acre parcel rather uh, and the 20.4 acres to be rezoned has not been subdivided out of the parcel yet thank you Thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, from uh, the commission to staff? Uh, Erica, we heard this case uh, quite a while ago or something uh, very similar related to this case. And at that time, there were a lot of uh, noncompliance issues and there were fees that had occurred. And I see here in the packet that they have resolved all those issues. Is that correct? Is that my understanding? That's correct, Madam Chair. If you look on pages 28 and 29, right. you will see that. I just wanted to make sure there was nothing else outstanding. No, thank uh, you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, may we hear from the petitioner's representative, please? Would you please come forward? Madam Chair? Oh, I'm a quick sorry. Quick question. I'm sorry. I thought I hit the request to, to speak. Uh, uh, I to didn't the staff, see it. Um, just the process again. So tonight we're looking at the rezone. Then in the development process, what, would, what are the next steps? Would, does this come back to us once they have a, a development plan, or what's the process? To the Chair, Mr. Mulcahy, the Commission will make a recommendation on the rezone. It will then go to the Assembly. If the Assembly approves the rezone, the petitioner will file for a platting action, which would go to the platting board. And assuming they get preliminary plat approval, that is the date that the rezone would become effective. That would be the time that the map is changed. Commissioner Mulcahy, does that answer your question? All right. I apologize. I did not see you in the queue. All right. Um, we're now opening the public hearing. May we hear from the petitioner? How do you do? My name is Greg Oskis. I represent Mr. Harmon, and I've been working with the uh, staff over the past two months to follow up on the what the historical uh, hearing two years ago. Um, the plan is, well, and I also had worked with the conservation easement in the development of that. The conservation easement is already in effect. It's comprehensive. It's in perpetuity. The 99 acres on the southern part of the property uh, can never be developed, cross-touched um, <clears throat> in any manner, and it's uh, monitored by the, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the Great Land Trust, which is a trustee. Um, whatever this board does tonight with respect to the, the rezoning is not going to affect the conservation easement. It's already been dedicated, and, and Mr. Harmon will never have the right to change it. Um, minor correction in the, the recommend in the staff report, there are services, to my understanding, to the property. There's gas to the edge of the property. There's electric to the edge of the property. There's telephone to the edge of the property put in, I think, in 2004. Um, it took four years to develop the conservation easement, which was completed in 2010 when Mr. Harmon came before uh, this uh, planning uh, commission in 2010. The violations, you know, were uh, of record. They were, had been disputed for a number of years. I worked with uh, the municipal attorney's office, Mr. Frost. Um, also, uh, uh, you know, right of way, we resolved those recently. This is the second time, and the submittal is virtually the same, except, uh, well, you know, virtually the same, except now we have the restrictions. My understanding of the restrictions are pretty straightforward. It's not, no commercial extraction of minerals, no commercial uh, dumping of snow, no large animal facilities. We don't have any objections to any of those. Um, with respect to the preliminary plat, what I spoke about with Mr. Winokur, we don't know if there's going to be 16 lots or four lots or, or seven lots. It depends somewhat on, this, on the soils, um, depends on economic conditions. What he suggested and what we plan is to spin this in our preliminary plat, divide it into a tract one and a tract two. Tract two will be the conservation easement remaining the PC. Tract one will just be the 20.4 acres zoned R6, and at some point, in, and we'll get it recorded, and at some point in time, when we decide the best use, pardon me, the best methodology of the actual subdivision in conjunction with the, uh, the municipality and the engineers, that's how it'll probably proceed. 
It probably won't proceed in the next 12 months. Who knows when, you know, uh, economics mandate that. But we would, I think it is an opportune time now that we've com completed the code issues uh, to just get the R6 in place and uh, move forward from here. All right, thank you very much. Um, you have uh, six minutes and 47 seconds left for the rebuttal. Um, are there any questions of the petitioner's representative? Uh, oh, that's quite all right. I didn't see any in the queue, or I would have had you stay up there. Are there any questions? No. All right. Um, is there anyone else here who would like to give testimony at this time? Would you please come forward? Uh, is there anyone else? Seeing and hearing no one, uh, would the petitioner's representative like to say anything else as far as rebuttal? No. All right. Thank you very much. The public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the commission? Commissioner Mulcahy. Yes, Mr. Chair, I move to approve case number 2012-096, request to rezone approximately 20.4 acres of a 120-acre parcel of land from planned community to R6 suburban residential district. All right. Thank you very much. That motion has been seconded by Commissioner Parks. Is there any objection to the motion? Uh, and I am assuming, Commissioner uh, Mulcahy, that um, the uh, – your motion includes the special limitations that are included on page 10 of your packet. And move to approve it with the limitations as put forth in the staff report. All right. And the effective clauses. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be supporting the motion. I just also wanted to state that um, part of the reason I'll be supporting is uh, the documentation that the owner has uh, rectified the code violations that previously existed on this site. And uh, noting that, as well as that, these standards for the zoning back map amendments have been either met or partially met, and those that are partially met will be met through future platting actions or the development of the property itself. I believe uh, we are right to support this motion. All right. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other findings of fact? Uh, Commissioner Mulcahy, would you like to speak to your motion? He just gave my findings. <laughs> he just gave your findings. Did he really? It's consistent with the plan, and as you said, the uh, the outstanding issues will be resolved during the further plan. All right. Thank you very much. Any, anybody want to say anything else? All right. Uh, is there any objection to the motion? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. All right. Thank you very much. Moving on to case number two, case 2012-095. This is the Fred Myers Stores, Inc. It's a site plan review for a large retail commercial establishment. Uh, may we hear from uh, staff, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. The commission, uh, let's see, the proposed renovation and expansion will add 4,179 square feet to the store gross floor area for a total of 168,207 square feet, which requires 561 parking spaces to achieve full compliance under current code. Currently, 455 parking spaces are provided. The petitioner had requested a parking variance that was heard from that was heard by Zeba last week, and Zeba did. Um, approve the variance request for that parking variance. The Commission has the authority to require improvements that do not exceed 10 percent of the overall cost of the expansion. The petitioner has submitted estimated costs for the improvements. These appear on page 47 of your packet. Also, the standards for large retail establishments are discussed on pages 3 through 7 of the staff packet. Uh, for these standards, most are either met or, or partially met. The mezzanine um, design, that new mezzanine level for the um, building, while it does add a great deal of visual interest to the building, and um, it is a significant imp improvement in the look of the building, 
we did, we, the division did has, did have some concerns regarding the security of that area. There are two bathrooms up there. There are no Fred Meyer staff that are going to be working and located on that, on that mezzanine level. And we do know of an instance in another city where there was a fast food restaurant that it did have a similar mezzanine level there and they did have um, issues with Ill Ill either illicit or illegal activities occurring on that mezzanine level. So um, I did um, speak to Mr. McNeil and asked him who is their uh, representative, um, how they proposed to deal with that issue and they said it was that sort of under discussion of how uh, they were going to deal with that. So hopefully tonight they have um, something, um, something re they've come to some resolution regarding those issues that they will um, discuss with us tonight. There was also um, an issue of what looked to be a curb at one of the um, store entrances and uh, I did also speak to Mr. McNeil about that, and he was going to try and get an answer for me on that. I, I didn't understand why they would have a curb out at the front of the store, so perhaps they have a, an answer for that. Also, I did have a condition number three about that, so um, that may or may not have to be modified once we um, hear from uh, the petitioner's representative tonight. There is also a um, vehicular entrance um, from Benson Boulevard. It's the one nearest to the Wendy store, where during the winter months there's no vegetation in a median. And so cars have, you know, we noticed last winter were driving over that median and not going down the driveway as the circulation pattern has been designed for safety reasons for them, for drivers to adhere to. So we, um, have noticed that and took this opportunity to um, um, present some um, recommendations that would help resolve that issue also. That's all I have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, do the commissioners have any questions of staff? Seeing and hearing none, the public hearing is now open and may we hear from the petitioner's representative. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Robert McNeil. I'm a senior planner with Barkhouse and Engineers in Kent, Washington. Uh, I have been d working with Ms. Ferguson to identify some of the issues and provide some solutions to, s to some of the questions that she had. Um, but first of all, a little bit of context. This is part of a continued Fred Meyer uh, corporate policy of upgrading and renovating their stores. In this particular case, the site constraints have been addressed as recently as 2010-2011 uh, with the construction of the fuel facility. And the results of that produced a traffic and circulation plan and parking plan that, uh, while not ideal, uh, basically satisfied all the participants, whether they were muni, uh, state, or staff. Um, as a result of that proposal, our design choices were somewhat limited, and the expansion, as it turns out, was pretty much uh, limited to about 1,500 square feet of uh, increase in the building, actual building footprint. The rest is in the interior of the structure, primarily on the mezzanine level. Uh, as far as specifically a couple of the issues raised by Ms. Ferguson, um, we did send an email with the uh, preliminary findings and analysis from Fred Meyer Corporate that uh, typically the mezzanine area would be patrolled by their loss prevention uh, team and there would be some form of video surveillance. We didn't know exactly how or where yet. That is still in the design stage. Um, it is a very visible mezzanine area, so there is a, a degree of visibility from the store and certainly from the outside. Regarding the curb issue, again, we provided a picture. There is a, what amounts to a rollover curb there in the facility uh, or in the area with uh, tactile ADA uh, materials. We have not had a chance to get through the design uh, team with that uh, issue, but we believe that we can work something out in terms of staff. Now, in terms of the exact uh, presentation of the uh, particulars of the design. We have uh, Mr. Terry Krause from Group McKenzie here who is the principal lead architect on that 
portion of the project. Thank you, Commission. My name is uh, Terry Krauss. I'm with Group McKenzie Architects in Portland. I'm the architect. Uh, I would like to just touch on a few of the things uh, regarding the, the questions. Um, the security, in addition to the loss prevention staff, they, they do have a pretty elaborate video surveillance program, and it is a fairly large mezzanine, so there are a lot of customers up there. It's, it's not going to be vacant. Fred Meyer has several mezzanines for seating in several other stores in Seattle, Fairbanks, and other areas that operate without a problem. So um, the last thing they want to do is create a negative environment for their customers. As far as the curb goes, the reason we showed a curb in that location was really just the preliminary nature of the design. We weren't sure if we would be able to work it out grading-wise to keep it flush all the way or not. If we did show bollards there because we definitely will have bollards if it is flush, but even if it isn't, we would then grade like an accessibility ramp so that customers could get carts down the ramp easily, but it may not be able to be the whole entire frontage. That, that remains to be seen when the grading design is done. Uh, as far as the design of the building, the intent for Fred Meyer is that the, it's, it's, it's a very significant interior remodel. We will be redoing almost the entire interior of the building, um, and it is a corporate rebranding and refreshing for a customer first, and we are redoing the entries, trying to bring them um, up to speed and make them much more customer friendly by providing the interior uh, bass cart storage so that the bass carts are dry and warm and not frozen and that kind of thing, as well as making them much more visible, multiple stories high with light so that they're very visible and oriented for the customer. And then we're also doing an upgrade to the building exterior with new, uh, more earth tone paint scheme uh, along with the design and the refresh of the entries. And if you have anything else. Uh, all right. Are there any questions? Uh, Commissioner Robinson? Through the chair, I, I know that we're, we're sort of, other than correcting a few kind of minor deficiencies from the parking lot improvements that were done previously, um, we're not really addressing it as part of this scope. But I, I couldn't help, since I do go to this store on occasion, and, and we'll say I think people are learning how to circulate it. It's been a bit of an adjustment, but I think they're figuring it out. But that said, I, I was sort of uh, amazed, and I don't know if you're the right person to ask, but when, when they added the landscape islands previously, I was surprised to see that the, the platforms on which the lights stand, the sort of yellow concrete platforms, were sort of enveloped within those, um, those landscape islands. And so you, you sort of added this really nice landscaping, but left these you know, concrete had been hit with cars and cracked uh, sort of looking things in the middle of them. And I wondered if it's ever come up to to dress those things up a little bit, perhaps paint them, repair them a little bit now that they're in uh, a landscaped area. You've done a lot of work in the store, but it's sort of a, a sort of a, a little bit of a black eye, if you will, as a common observer of the site. Any thoughts? Well, honestly, I'm the architect of the building and not the site, so I haven't, I wasn't involved in that, that part of it. Last time I was at the site, there was four feet of snow. <laughs> so, maybe about my head. I guess I got handed the ball on this one. Um, that issue had been discussed briefly, uh, but it was a little bit late in the design process when we went through the fuel station. Um, we did uh, replace some of the bollards uh, in some, one of the areas, in particular on uh, Benson. Uh, I, as far as maintenance, I, I don't think there would be a problem in cleaning them up and repainting or what whatnot. Uh, in some cases where they were incorporated into the landscape, I can personally vouch for the fact our landscape architect did not like it. I heard about it from him. Uh, but on the other hand, um, there was... We were, again, somewhat limited in terms of trying to maintain the existing parking levels, and we... We literally traded landscaping for parking in this particular case, so we, we didn't go too far. We didn't perhaps didn't go far enough in that particular area, but it's something I think we can take a look at. And uh, if I can, uh, one other quick question. Do, do, do you all you all agree with staff's recommendations? I mean, you've alluded to working with staff through those, but are they, uh, as they're written, uh, you all are in agreement with those? 
Well, we have, um, I, I visited the site, and the one in particular that, that I have a concern about is the, the one with the boulders and the tree. There is a drainage path over there uh, cut between the two, land, two separate landscape areas. And I have to confirm this with our landscape architect, but I'm not sure that there is a wide enough landscape island there to put in in that particular location where the tree is, would more than likely and uh, or try to be placed. I'm not sure if there's uh, room there to put the tree and make sure it survives. And getting landscaping to survive in this in this particular location with the traffic and whatnot is difficult. So that's something we can look at. It has not been discussed yet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Ferguson. I have one question. Maybe it's back to the architect. He he addressed a, a ramp at the front. Is it that I plan to provide uh, a heated ramp or let it become a slip and slide zone? Honestly, we haven't gotten that far down the down the road. Normally, what we try to do is, I mean, we'll we'll have to work within the the confines. If the exterior ramp, I'm not sure how the store maintains the exterior sidewalks. I don't. We haven't really discussed specifically if it would be heated or not. I'm not sure by which means they would heat it if they don't have a boiler plant, that kind of thing. Um, we have the opportunity to do it. It will be new concrete, so it's certainly not off the table. I mean, depending on the ramp, but we, I would encourage you to, to heat it just to provide for less slips and falls. I think if that's uh, feasible, we you know definitely consider that. I I think that ideally the whole sidewalk would just generally slope and be flush with the concrete with the bollards, and that's the intent of having the lighted bollards is to keep vehicles out and just keep a even transition there. Um, any any grade break at all really? We get a lot of um, icing conditions up here, and um, I would just plan, or whatever you can do to help alleviate that concern. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, just, if you would please stay at the podium. Uh, Commissioner Mulcahy has a question. Yeah, I'll be honest. I'm a little bit confused. The plan, the traffic folks had some concern about the backup on Benson, and I read the, your analysis, but can you just try to summarize what your approach on, on the backup, the traffic backup on Benson? How are you going to, what your actions are to mitigate that? For, for the mezzanine? No, on the, the, the traffic backup. The, the, oh. the parking folks, uh, excuse me, the, tra the traffic the folks in their analysis. That, the, the, the plan would, back, would create a, a backup on Benson. Well, the plan, the, the traffic plan that was reviewed in part with the fuel station uh, construction back in 10 and 11, and the backup on Benson was specifically addressed with ADOT and that was the reason for the change right there by the Wendy's with the uh, turn-in ramp. Uh, other than that, we have not had any discussions. Uh, Benson, or excuse me, the state uh, DOT people did say they would get back to us if there was a problem, and they have not gotten back to us because that, that was put in originally as a, 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 a test, so to speak, and uh, it was finalized, and there has been... No, no uh, recommendations from DOT at this point. There's a letter in here that says that they don't have any, any objections. My name is Randy Mitchell. I'm the store director at the, the Fred Meyer location. Uh, so these guys draw it up, but I have to live with it. Um, and based off what I've seen, it's pretty good. A couple points on the parking lot that uh, I'd observed and the remodel, 75% of our transactions are express transactions, what we'd call 12 items or less, customers getting in, getting out, getting on their way. Um, a couple things that this remodel is doing that I, I noticed are going to help us out quite a bit is they've added, a, I believe, six additional check stands. So at busy times, we can get the customer in the store, out of the store faster, on the lot, off the lot faster. Uh, the other thing is, I, I don't know if you guys have been in our stores, but you've seen the mini carts versus the full-size carts. Um, the mini carts are a lot more maneuverable, a lot easier to get in and around the store. Uh, the, the remodel scope is going to make it a lot easier for the customer to get in and out. Uh, one of the things we're doing is transitioning to a 50-50 mix uh, starting this fall of the mini carts versus the full-size carts. So those two things alone are going to help us focus on getting that express customer, which is 75% of our customers, in the store and out of the store a little faster. 
thereby keeping that, that um, parking situation flowing. Uh, and then to address uh, just uh, the uh, security with the MEZ, uh, you know, any store is going to have those areas where you have a criminal element or a homeless element. And our loss prevention teams are really good at ad identifying those areas at whatever store in town we're at and uh, just policing them. Um, it's, I'm not going to say it's not an issue. It's an issue in every store. Uh, however, we're, we're pretty good at mitigating those issues wherever they do arise. Uh, the other thing that Fred Meyer is doing with these remodels is they're putting in a saturation camera system. Uh, the, the amount of cameras that go in uh, double or triple uh, so you get uh, less blind spots in the store. And this would certainly be an area where you would have camera coverage and a loss prevention team monitoring it. All right, thank you very much. Uh, do any of the, I'll just stay at the podium for just one second. Uh, are there other questions um, at this time? There's someone behind you, or are you with the I'm public, with, or you're with them? I'm with the team. I'm Gary Katzian with Kittleson and Associates here in Anchorage. And there's a uh, question about the Benson driveway. Uh, we have a letter that's in the packet on page 22 from the Department of Transportation that uh, reviewed the analysis and they provided no additional comments on it. Uh, I was also involved in the redesign uh, when we did the gas station of changing the uh, driveways on Benson from what was before right in, right out, and that's where the backups were occurring. There was a lot of backups conflicting with the traffic coming out of the site. They've now been totally separated, and it works a lot better. I use this store all the time. So uh, we have not had any comments uh, from public about that since then, since the change last year. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from commissioners? Well, I have a couple of questions. So. Um, um, I have a question for the architect and the store manager. So um, it seems to me that uh, Benson Boulevard is um, a very active road as far as traffic is concerned. So when I look at the south elevation, I'm rather disappointed. Um, I'm disappointed with the current uh, elevation and design, and this one doesn't seem to be a lot better than what's currently there. So if you have improved it, could you address it and tell us how you've improved um, the south elevation? Well, honestly, we've, you know, we're, we're very challenged by trying to improve some of the elevations just based on the fixture plan. The south elevation happens to be where the stock room is, so trying to put openings and that kind of thing in there don't work very well because we've got stock room and coolers and freezers and that kind of thing, so opening it up doesn't doesn't work very well. So honestly, in that regard, we've tried to focus the exterior improvements to where the customer areas are and primarily paint, landscape, that kind of thing on the building. We haven't proposed new openings or windows or anything there. We've also got challenges with energy code compliance because the building is already not meeting the energy code. So sitting with the building department and trying to put new openings in the existing building is going to be challenging because we're already not meeting the energy code. I wasn't necessarily advocating new openings in the south side, but I was advocating perhaps a more interesting paint or uh, skin fascia look because of the amount of traffic that is on Benson Boulevard. Yeah, I mean, it's we tried to stick with a similar paint design or based on the features that are there and highlight them. And, you know, we've come up with several different options and proposed some to, you know, the team and tried to propose what we thought was a reasonable effort on that. It's certainly up to, you know, for, for opinion. Would you have any suggestions on how this south elevation could be improved? Well, I'd have to take another look at it. We, Like I said, we've been trying to limit it mostly to paint, and um, we've come up with some different paint options. We could certainly look at other options that we've, that we've got and see, submit those to staff for, for input. 
Well, I think that would be very beneficial. Um, Benson Boulevard does have a tr significant amount of traffic associated with it, and this elevation doesn't seem to do much beyond what the current elevation does. Um, I do have another question. You identified um, that there was stone on the um, what would be the west side of the building, the primary entrance side. Yes. And I was wondering, that looked like a sort of a stone wainscot, and I was wondering um, what the dimensions were as far as the height for that is concerned. Um, right now at the entries, we've got kind of a little wainscot at the entry areas that's about three and a half feet high, and then vertical elements that go up to 40 feet high at both entries. And uh, I'm assuming that the vertical element that's 40 feet high is not stone, or is it stone? Or? No, it will be clad in stone. The, the natural stone will carry from the exterior, the lower pedestrian levels, and then go up and carry up through the mezzanine. and. There's a fireplace, so that's kind of like the chimney element that goes through at that entry. And then a similar design element that goes up through the other entry as well, but those will be all stone from the outside. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can work on that south elevation. Oh, I just have one more question of the store manager. This is a personal question. Are you going to have a salad bar? I hope so. It's, it's been requested. I haven't seen a, uh, the most current plan. I know the cheese kiosk is going to be there, and I know they're expanding the deli. Basically, all the fresh departments are going to expand significantly. The nutrition department will uh, expand significantly, probably double, uh, if not triple in size. So, yeah, I would love to see a salad bar. I would all right. For it. Thank you very much. All right. Um, is there anyone here who um, would like to give testimony on case... 2012-094, is there anyone here at all? All right, um, you have for rebuttal uh, five minutes and 29 seconds. If you have anything else you'd like to say about the stone or the salad bar or anything at all? Nothing? All right, seeing and hearing uh, no other uh, requests, um, this case is, uh, the public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the commission in case 2012-095? May I have a motion, please? Commissioner Parks. Madam Chair, in case number 2012-095, Fred Meyer Store, Midtown Location, amended site plan review. I make a motion that we approve this case, uh, including the requirements under staff recommendations on page 8. Uh, I need to say, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to say a little bit more. I apologize. And it's been seconded by Dana Pruse. Is there um, any uh, other comments? All right, seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. May we have some findings of uh, uh, Commissioner Robinson? Sorry, Madam Chair. I, I, I think um, I don't have the specific wording, but I, I believe the, as, as, uh, as currently written, we would be prescribing a specific tree in a particular area of the site that the petitioner has stated may or may not actually do any good or survive past this next winter. And so um, with a little patience here, I'd like to uh, um, have a motion for an amendment to the main motion. And uh, that would read uh, under recommendation number four, uh, substituting where it says a two-inch Swedish columnar aspen tree and minimum of four two to three-foot boulders to simply say physical separation shall be added in this gap to prevent drivers from driving over the median specific um, plan to be resolved with staff. All right. Um, you've made that in the form of a motion to the main motion. And is there a second? Can I motion here is the main motion on there? 
Right, seconded by Commissioner Ferguson. So, um, Madam Secretary, so do we have to vote on this motion separately? Yes. All right. Is there any objection to the motion? Seeing and hearing none, that motion is approved. Now we're back to the main motion. Um, and that was uh, Commissioner Parks, and it was seconded by uh, Commissioner Pruz. Is that correct? Did you second that? All right. Uh, would you like to speak to your motion, please? Yes, Madam Chair. I, I would like to make a couple of observations. Um, I used to operate a business on the corner of Northern Lights and, and New Seward Highway years ago um, in the 80s. And I can say that the traffic pattern in there is much better than it was years ago. And the way they police uh, the uh, station and the, uh, the parking lot is, is, is very nice. And I didn't think that you would travel across that parking lot going through the uh, as I call it, the yellow brick road, but people actually do use those walkways. And, and I, uh, I was uh, not a fan of that when we first saw it. Um, away from that, other than that, I, I would think that uh, we, we're seeing that you're actually taking a look at the issues that uh, staff have brought up, and we appreciate the, uh, the attitude of what you take. And I think it meets all the requirements uh, that uh, were delivered to, to you in this uh, packet. All right, thank you very much. Is there, are there any other comments or findings of fact? Seeing and hearing none, that case is approved. Uh, are there any objections? No, no objections to the main motion. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn the gavel over to Commissioner Parks. Thank you. We are now ready to hear case number S11864-2, uh, Potter Highland Subdivisions, Lot 1 through 11, Block 1, Lot 1-6, Block 2, Lot 1-8, Block 3, Lots 1-4, uh, Block 4, and tracks A4A, A4B, A4C, and B3. This is an amendment to a preliminary plat previously approved by the Planning and Zone Commissioning on uh, June 6, 2011, with variances from AMC 21.08.240 design standards cul-de-sac for the length of the cul-de-sac exceeding the maximum 900 feet of the rural uh, residential district. Uh, can we hear from staff, please? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, um, first of all, there are um, two uh, uh, handouts, uh, late comments, uh, supplemental information uh, laid on the, the table. One is just a one-pager. And the other has a, a few sheets. Um, I just want to go through them real quickly. Um, the Rabbit Creek, Rabbit Creek Community Council provided um, a letter in support of the variance and um, also, um, you know, urging upholding uh, Hillside District plan policies. Um, there's a, uh, an email uh, that was received um, by a uh, member of the public that's uh, also expressing uh, uh, um, the importance of uh, uh, pedestrian connections and uh, trails on the hillside, and uh, particularly um, the one uh, that's being proposed uh, uh, by staff uh, from uh, the cul-de-sac, the proposed cul-de-sac, Breeze Drive, um, down to Potter Valley Road. Um, and then there's a, a comment from uh, Chugach Electric. The other comment is from the petitioner, and it's just uh, um, additional sort of justification for the uh, subdivision variances. 
Uh, with that, I'll go to the staff report. Um, uh, on page 12 of the packet, you'll see uh, the uh, approved uh, preliminary plat, and then on page 13, you'll show the revision, which is before the commission um, this evening. Uh, this is a request for an amendment to a preliminary plat a, a previously approved by the commission on uh, June 6, uh, uh, 2011, with a variance from design standards for uh, cul-de-sacs for the length of the cul-de-sac exceeding uh, the maximum 900 feet in the rural residential district. This is an R6 district. If the variance is granted, the total cul-de-sac length, Grease Drive, uh, will be approximately 2,000 feet. The petitioner is proposing uh, to redesign lots 1 through 6, block 2, to allow access uh, from Grease Drive rather than uh, a new cul-de-sac from Potter Valley Road. The number of lots will not change, nor will the general location of the lots change. The purpose of the request is to eliminate an intersection on Potter, Potter Valley Road that would require an increase in the grade of Potter Valley Road. Uh, if this request is approved, the proposed new cul-de-sac uh, Potter Highland Circle um, would be eliminated from the subdivision. Um, staff explains in uh, uh, the analysis that uh, it appears that uh, uh, standards 1, 2, 3, and 4 uh, uh, of the subdivision variants, uh, those standards appear to be met. Um, therefore, uh, the department recommends uh, to the commission as their first action to approve the variants um, as it's written uh, in the staff report on page 9 under uh, uh, section A. Um, and then as its uh, second action, uh, the department recommends that the uh, plat be approved subject to conditions 1 through 5 on pages uh, 9 and uh, 10 of the packet. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have any questions of staff? Commissioner Ferguson? Could you turn your mic on? Thank you. The 10.5% um, grade, uh, do we have other roads of that steepness in the community? Uh, yes, we do. I think they're trying to limit new roads and their grades. Um, to uh, standards, but uh, I'm afraid uh, I, I know that there are some steep roads. Um, uh, Don Kiefer in uh, private development uh, uh, tries to keep them within the grades uh, which allow emergency access and, and uh, um, meet our DCM. Okay. Second question has to do with the, the email exchange that took place today and talking about the word easement versus the word trail. Um, uh, Thursday's meeting for the assembly workshop was talking about Title 21. They got wrapped around the axle on this very question. Um, how are you going to determine where the trail goes if it's not within an easement? Well, um um, the petitioner in their presentation is going to provide uh, a, a proposed revised wording uh, for these two conditions. Um, it's something that uh, we've worked out and that staff supports. Uh, you'll be hearing from the petitioner about that. Um, uh, staff feels strongly that um, uh, an easement which uh, encumbers somebody's private property um, uh, causes problems. Uh, because uh, the uh, yard setback begins at the lot boundary. And so that brings a trail closer to um, someone's home. Um, it's uh, it's a, a trail crossing their private property uh, for a public purpose. Uh, just creates problems. Uh, people feel like they're trespassing. Uh, it's problematic. Um, having uh, a dedicated right-of-way uh, and then the trail within it um, is definitely the way to go because um, it's not across someone's private property and um, it uh, allows uh, pedestrian uh, connect connectivity um, without the fear of trespassing. Thank you. I'll, I'll listen to what the petitioner proposes. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, I think the comments uh, both by I want to say that um, a member of staff, trails uh, coordinator, uh, as well as some of the public, public uh, comments, address that once 
you know, once one considers the elimination of the roadway, the through roadway through Greece, um, so we're at, it's ending now in a cul-de-sac, um, that it's still important to extend a trail because that trail is shown in the Hillside District Plan. Um, I think my question is, you know, I believe the reason that trail was shown in the Hillside District Plan is because when developing the plan, they were using the underlying plat, which showed a road through there. And so essentially there was recognition that where there will be a road, there will also be a trail. I'm wondering if you can address, you know, certainly I do support that there be trails along all the roads that we create um, on the hillside or anywhere within the municipality. Um, where it's appropriate, but I, I, I guess my question is now that, you know, we're effectively by granting this variance in a sense, we're amending the Hillside District Plan. You know, we're sort of going along with it by saying there will be changes through development, through platting actions, through whatever that will alter, you know, or tweak some of what is presented there. So my question is, to t tell me why staff still feels that the trail is a necessary connection um, given that the road will not be there. Um, through the chair, uh, Mr. Robinson, it's common practice uh, whenever property is uh, subdivided or resubdivided that um, staff look for opportunities for pedestrian connectivity, um, even if there isn't um, uh, vehicular connectivity. So the platting board regularly sees plats, and uh, whenever there's a new plat and uh, there's a subdivision uh, of a residential nature, and uh, we see lots of cul de sacs or dead ends. Um, uh, we look for uh, ways to connect those cul-de-sacs uh, uh, for uh, pedestrian rights of way, particularly around uh, schools or parks. Um, uh, so that's a common practice. Thank you. Any other questions of staff? Okay. We will now give the petitioner, we'll open up the hearing and give the petitioner an opportunity to speak. And you have uh, 10 minutes. And how much time would you like to hold on to? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to reserve three minutes, please. Thank Mr. Chairman, members of the board, my name is David Grenier with Triad Engineering, and with me this evening is the project manager, Mr. Rick Davidge, and the project surveyor, Janice Zilko. This, um, the purpose of this, um, uh, this request tonight is amendment, as staff said, to the previously approved preliminary plat, uh, which had a, and it's along with a cul-de-sac variance. The reason, a brief history, why we're, we're having to uh, ask this is that the hillside, especially in this area in uh, Potter Valley, has some very challenging road grade issues and locations. The, um, in the overhead here, this was what was presented to you um, uh, previously and was approved. And what that entailed was an intersection on Potter Valley Road. Whenever you do an intersection, you need a road grade of 5% or less across the intersection and then transition uh, uh, curves into that. What that resulted in is a road to the north towards the existing Potter Valley Road of fills in excess of 20 feet. So in looking at that, it did not follow um, several things. One, the Hillside District Plan is pretty specific, try to limit the amount of, amount of uh, clearing and, and uh, scarring, if you will. And uh, also a very expensive fill with, and with a lot of guardrail along the side. So we work with staff on several things. One, for a variance on road grade and then uh, also different configurations. And that's what brought us to the option of 
accessing Greece. Um, we looked at this from a topographic standpoint in access and uh, came to the conclusion that it does work. Um, one of the main questions that we had, though, under this configuration is the existing conditions of Greece Drive adequate to handle these additional six lots. Uh, staff and through Public Works and traffic did a uh, site visit and came back with a conclusion that existing conditions were adequate for this without upgrades. So with that, with that assurance, we made the application and brought the uh, brought this plat forward. One of the, um, the issues that's been discussed is trails. Um, this is an overview of the entire project. I apologize for the fuzziness. But um, we are not objecting at all to the connection to to Grease Drive as far as the trail goes. Um, we have a detached, if you will, nature trail, a pedestrian trail only that comes from the existing road along the top of the cut through the existing vegetation, both along the north-south run of Potter Valley Road and then also the east-west. We're proposing a connection to Greece in this location, and then we're also uh, also, as part of the road standards, which is a cl uh, collector standard, there is a four-foot bike trail on each side of uh, attached on each side of the travel lanes uh, along Potter Valley Road. So we're proposing uh, several connections of the detached nature trail to that paved section, and that would occur basically in an in this location here and then back up at this. So we'll have one, two, three, four along that stretch and one at each end along the east-west portion. We would like to um, make a suggestion, a change to the wording on condition number three and four. We feel that it's not clear enough for, for what the intent is and this would be the reading that we've worked out with staff and which we feel is, is, is appropriate. Basically it says uh, dedicate a 10 foot right of way and, and construct an unpaved trail from Grease Drive through the detached unpaved trail along Potter Valley Road. The constructed trail shall have the same level of, of improvement and width as the detached trail along Potter Valley Road. We feel that addresses the intent of, of staff and the, and the uh, trails coordinator and it meets, meets our plan. The, the question of where the trail should be is uh, basically whether it's in an easement or in a, dedicate, a dedication, we are fine with doing a trail right-of-way dedication. However, we've got a number of, uh, most of the trail is in tracks, open space tracks. And what we propose is a note on the plat that says if you have an open space track, uh, one of the uses is for the pedestrian trail. With that, I'd uh, like to answer any questions. Do we have any questions? And you have how many minutes left? Uh, two minutes? You have four minutes and nine seconds for me. Thank you, rebuttal. Yeah. What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, Stacy, you have some questions? Uh, through the chair, um, my question is of the petitioner on that trail. From, that you're talking about from Grease Drive to Potter Valley Road, what would be the grade of that trail? Do you know by any chance? Through the chair, it'd be in the range of probably six to eight percent max. Thank you. 
One other thing I'd like to, if I may, like to point out, uh, there has been, uh, when I understand there's been a question on a connection road from England up to, uh, up to, uh, to Greece Drive. And we looked at that just to give you a comparison on grades. That is a 16% grade. Ms. Ferguson, do you have a comment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm actually Lori Skanky. I'm the trails coordinator, but I don't have a button, so okay. thank you for <laughs> letting me speak. Um, I had one correction for Mr. Grenier, and then I had a couple of comments. Mr. Grenier mentioned that uh, alongside the road there were there was a four-foot paved bike trail on both sides, and that is incorrect. It's actually as part of the road there are paved shoulders. Uh, in a situation where we don't have pathways right near the road, we have a paved shoulder which allows not only bicyclists to use the facility, but also people to walk. Uh, we don't want to call it a bike lane because that means bikes only. So I just wanted to correct Mr. Grenier there, and he's nodding, so that's a good sign. Um, the other statement that I have is I cannot remember, and I should have dug up my notes, um, what the previous development called the nature trail because I think we should be a little more specific and say was it um, a five foot paved trail was it an or unpaved trail was it eight foot rather than have the same level of improvement and width because then things just start getting vague and I would prefer to just be more specific if we could please. And um, those are my comments, other than the fact that the Hillside District Plan also notes uh, pathways along the road, and I'm hoping that Grease Drive has that as well. That's all I have. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you. No, thank you, sir. Mr. Bruce. Yeah, I, I brought this up at the last when this thing came up originally to us. And as a question about uh, maybe the petitioner can answer it, uh, two questions. One is, what is the the uh, maximum grade on the roadway in the subdivision? What's the, what's the steepest grade? In the uh, Potter Highland Road, the steepest grade is 10.5 percent, which we uh, obtained a variance for. Okay, 10 point. And, and so my question is, is what is, the, what is the distance between the paved shoulder and the ditch? What is the distance between the paved shoulder and what? And the ditch or the drainage structure. Oh, the drainage. There's, there's a two-foot gravel shoulder on the outside of the paved shoulder. On and then side? There is, on the uphill side, there is a two-foot gravel shoulder that goes to a two-foot um, swale. On the downhill side, there is no swale or ditch. The road is tilted all in one direction, so the drainage off the road goes towards the, the cut side. Because that's, a, that's your typical, that's a typical section? That's correct. So, okay, so being a hillside resident, uh, and, and when it gets icy, what, what will the vehicles do with essentially no gravel off the shoulder to stop on a 10% grade? Your question is, if it's a, if it's paved all the way across, and you have sure. a, and you have a four foot shoulder that's paved, basically and, and that that section is the same as Rubber Creek Road, which is twelve percent max uh, when you're coming up off uh, up to, I believe it's Elmore, and then from Golden View Drive north, that's twelve percent. So we're looking at the same typical section. I, I understand that, but the question is, what what do the vehicles do when they hit the I see. What, what, what are their options if it's paved essentially ac across the typical section? Yeah. yeah. Well, you've got a guardrail on one side and you have a ditch on the other. Those are your options. Okay. Well, my observation is if you had a, a, a bigger, a, a wider sec section between the ditch or the swale on each side that would give some relief for gravel because when you, when you plow, 
you'd have some sort of resistance for the tires to stop the vehicle. Well, we would love to do the gravel shoulder rather than the paved shoulder. Yeah. That would be a, something we'd be uh, open to. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. I just wanted to clarify. I believe I heard uh, Ms. Kanky talk about um, desiring trails on Grease Drive. Can I ask the petitioner, is that is that part of the plan? And if so, is, are we just talking about just this little section here? Through the chair, we, we are not anticipating a trail along Grease because of the short distance. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. We are now open for the public hearing, and you will be limited to uh, three minutes uh, if you're an individual. And if you're a part of a group, you have ten minutes. If you come forward, please stay five minutes. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Five minutes. Okay. Well, hello. Thank you for having me this evening. My name is Catherine Woods. Um, I live two lots away from the proposed extension of Grease Drive, and I've, I'm a former Larissa chair of the Paradise Valley South Larissa. Um, I'd like to talk to you about three things tonight that I don't think have been adequately discussed. The first is the, the capability of Grease Drive to actually handle the construction traffic for these six homes and for the extension. The second is the issue about giving the developer a free ride on the Larissa um, for any damage to the roads that may occur. And frankly, the third is lack of adequate engagement of the community in the public process. Initially, what I would say to you is that for the city to say that there are no issues with Grease Drive's ability to handle this traffic is inaccurate. Four years ago when I was chair of the Larissa, I asked the city to study what improvements were required to the Larissa roads. None of those improvements have been made, but a significant list was provided by the city. So all of those issues still are in place. What I would say to you is that Greece is a very narrow road. It's a dirt road. We have grades well above 10.5% in several places. It's difficult to pass safely now with two cars in the summertime. In the wintertime, it's almost impossible. There's a limited turnaround area for large trucks of the type necessary for construction. Drainage, dust, rutting, glaciation, all of these things are major impacts to Grease Road. None of these things, I believe, have been adequately considered. Um, snow removal is an issue, as is snow storage. Again, having an additional six homes will simply exacerbate this condition. Beyond that, I would say there are many small families with small children directly on Grease Drive. Their properties front very closely to it. This becomes a public safety hazard when we have large trucks trespassing. That to the issue of, of Grease Road and its ability to handle it. My firm belief is it can't. I don't believe that's been considered. So let's go to the second point. Paradise Valley South is a Larissa. Guess how big it is? It's a quarter mile long. You guys are talking about building a cul-de-sac that's 2,000 feet. It's more than our entire Larissa. But you know what? Our road, rutted, dirt, small, is going to absorb all of the issue of major trucks passing through. We, the 20 homes that support this Larissa, are going to absorb all of the cost for the six. Currently, this property is not annexed to the, the, the Larissa, and we believe it should be. It is simply not fair for the current residents of Grease Drive to pay for a for-profit developer and the costs that will be accrued there. I believe in addition that the public process has not been adequate. Um, I spoke with Dick Tremaine today, the chair of the, of the Rabbit Creek Board. What he said to me is that he doesn't believe that anybody directly neighboring the area was involved in any of the discussion. Is that time? Do we have any questions? Uh, I would like for you to finish your thoughts, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, I will tell you anecdotally, having attended the Neighborhood Book Club a week ago, uh, where most of the neighbors attend, I didn't hear anything about this. That indicates to me that people are not well informed. Um, tertiarily, I would say to you that the project manager, in speaking with him earlier tonight, said that he's been fielding many comments and questions from people, indicating that they're unaware. 
So I'm very concerned that there was not an appropriate notice. I'm very concerned that the LARISA is not prepared to take on the cost and the added damage to the roads that this project could cause. And I'm thoroughly concerned that the road really is in no condition to enable that. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hold on just a second. We have a couple of questions. Could you spell your last name for us, please? Sure. Woods, W-O-O-D-S. And Commissioner Robinson? Thank you. Through the Chair, a couple of questions, ma'am. Sure. Um, when you talk about the LURSA, are you talking about principally on Greece Drive, so France and Greece, or what's the extent of the LURSA boundary? Uh, the LURSA is one quarter mile in length. It incorporates France Circle. Um, it incorporates Greece Drive um, from top to bottom, and it incorp incorporates Denmark Circle. Okay. And the entirety of that is one quarter mile, um, far less than the, than the 2,000, uh, sorry, yeah, far less than the 2,000 feet cul-de-sac that y'all are looking to build. Uh, just, just to clarify, ma'am, and I'm sure we, we staff would probably weigh on this as well, but I, I, I believe that the variance that we're hearing is because there's a certain limit that a cul-de-sac could be. Grease Drive as it exists currently basically functions as a cul-de-sac and is probably, correct me if I'm wrong, already sort of exceeding what, whatever distance a cul-de-sac should be. The extension, as I see it, is, is by no means larger than what exists there currently. Is that is that correct? Uh, it is larger. The entire Larissa is is a quarter mile when you take off Denmark Circle and take off France. Uh, Greece Drive is perhaps a thousand feet in length, so we're almost talking about double. For the record, Greece Drive dead ends. It is not functioning as a cul-de-sac. Um, there are two driveways that split off of it at the end, but there is no functional cul-de-sac currently in place. Uh, okay, so dead end. If you want to use that terminology, I'd be happy to, to use that. But I just want to clarify a couple issues here because I think you've raised some good ones. But one is, in, as it relates to the LURSA, I see six new lots that would be created that would be using those uh, grease drive on a daily basis post-construction, I'm talking. Do you, do you agree with me there? Um, I would agree with that, and, and I have no issue with the six lots that would be using Grease Drive post-construction. My concern is that the property is not currently annexed to the Larissa. Therefore, any damage caused by construction is, is paid for by the current residents. So I would hope that this property would be annexed to the Larissa prior to construction beginning and prior to subdivision so that the annexation could take place and these guys would pay their fair share. Okay, no, I understand your point. One, the, my last question is, you know, as it's currently platted, it actually, Grease Drive goes through to Potter Valley Road. So as, the, as it currently exists, this petitioner could develop a road all the way through there right, right then. Do you, do you prefer that option to this option here? I think... It makes more sense to simply plat it through to a cul-de-sac, provided that the other concerns can be managed. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Ferguson. Um, you said that the, the rest of for Greece had 20 homes, right? Correct. You also said that the risk included Denmark, Greece, and France, right? Correct. So that's got 40 lots. There are 40 lots. Um, on those 40 lots, there are approximately 20 homes that have been built. There are numerous lots that are not yet built, um, and some that have been combined. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Hans Roderink. I will spell that, R-O-E-T-E-R-I-N-K. I just want to quickly mention two, um, or underline two of the statements were made, pri uh, made prior, and then two additional statements. One is I also live on France Circle, so I do use the entire road up. Um, I do believe that um, the assessment made by the city at this point of the quality of the road is surprising to me. Um, as you hear, I'm a foreigner. I'm used to a different road system in Europe. It is surprising to me that somebody that qualifies a road that generates more dust than anything else is considered a method of increasing traffic. Um, but in that sense, I think that whoever is added, or what, the amount of traffic added to the, the traffic pattern 
uh, should also pay for its own its, its own usage. So I strongly agree with the, the uh, Ms. Woods to have this be annexed as part of the Larissa prior to the actual build out of the facility so that we do not pay for somebody else's construction. What I would like to add is my surprise. I, I, we live on the hillside. I, there's a property that actually goes further up in the big amount that the gentleman shows. There is a new neighborhood there. There is a 20-foot wide road, four-foot sections on the side. I'd like your comment about what do you do if you start sliding. We have seen some of the folks there over the winter. Um, the interesting thing for me is that road dead ends. It's a paved section that dead ends into the um, dirt road of Potters. So the same situation I hear would be applicable as well. There would be a nice paved section that then drops into an unpaved section of grease, which is interesting if you look at it from a drainage perspective because the road washes away every year because of the water rushing over the dirt. So here is two gentlemen trying to put, propose a section with, with drainage that ends up in grease and there is no way for the water to go. So what we are proposing here is a, is a, is a paved section, a quarter mile of dirt and a paved section where the water from the paved section will find the road of least assistance, which is our driveway going down south. So if you, and I, I will say, I have no problem with six houses additionally to it. But if you do this, then at least make the road that connects Potters, Mar uh, Potters to the new section in Greece of the same quality as both ends are accustomed to. So you have solved the issues with drainage and have solved the issues of people safely walking on the, on the road, both on the bottom and the top side, and don't get killed in the quarter mile in between. So I strongly suggest that you go ahead with this plan with the additions that the road that connects both sections is brought to the same standard as you currently use. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hold on just a second. Um, Commissioner Robinson, you had a couple of comments. I think, I think you make a good observation, and I think uh, this, I think is in terms of the, and, and again, I'll ask staff to correct me if I misspeak here, but I, I believe that staff has decided and the Hillside District Plan sort of populates that the appropriate standard for the roads on the hillside are to have a paved, you know, a paved section of road. That went through a whole lot of conversation and debate, as you may well know, whether, whether it's still appropriate to have dirt roads, gravel roads on the hillside. That said, the issue that you sort of present is really one of who pays and uh, in terms of who pays for this center section. So I believe if you pose the question to the petitioner, they would more than likely say we'd be happy to not pave that road. In terms of who pays for the, the roadway between on that quarter mile stretch, uh, the municipality would say it's not our responsibility. Um, I personally don't believe, and I, I sense from your comments that you may not believe that it's necessarily the full responsibility of someone building six homes there to fully bear the burden there. But I'll, if you beg to differ with me, that's fine. And, and then there's the issue of how about the other homes that, that are on Greece Drive and that, that, that use it, should they actually bear some of the cost of, of whatever improvements there. And therein lies our dilemma here and the limits of our jurisdiction here this evening of what we can and cannot do. And I think you've put your, your uh, you know, you've pointed to something that it will continue to be a problem, uh, especially in our, in our parts of our um, municipality like the Hillside and uh, Eagle River. But I, I, you know, I wonder if, if down the road you would see it appropriate that if there's improvements to Grease Drive that you, you believe that it should be uh, shared by all users of Grease Drive or who in fact should pay for that improvement. Of course, I cannot talk for the rest of the homeowners, but uh, I'm in strong favor of upgrading the road all the way, and I would pay my way, no pun intended, to, uh, to do that. But again, my biggest worry is that being on the hillside, generating a very slippery slope, all pun intended, for snow and water to rush down, that uh, the increased maintenance will will be staggering because it's already washing away, let alone if you add uh, 
I don't know how long the section is, of water that partially will run out. So that's my biggest fear. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. I'm Diane Holmes, and I'm wearing my best-used car salesman hat for you on this very sunny evening. Um, some residents and the council are pleased that the city acknowledged the Hillside District Plan and its flexibility for roads, including gravel roads, Mr. Robinson, in portions, where drainage and slopes are issues. I'm glad that a wide road cut will not now be required in a very inappropriate steep place on this plat. And I'm happy to have an unpaved, separated path that is reduced in size from the usual city standards. That, again, is where the Hillside District Plan allows for flexible standards. But I'm here advocating for other aspects of this plat that are also part of the Hillside District Plan. Fulfilling these conditions, such as pedestrian connection from Greece, are not only part of the Hillside District Plan, but are a key policy of our comp plan, Policy 55, Mr. Robinson. While some of you may not be in the habit of using pedestrian facilities, <clears throat> despite what your doctor recommends, they are part of an overall citywide feature that contributes to access between neighborhoods and promotes walking. Um, notice that in various national ratings of cities, Anchorage comes out near the top, at least for our pathways. Aside from pedestrian connections being a policy in 2020 and shown on the Hillside District Plan, there's overall good business. It's overall good business to continue this theme of connecting neighborhoods. If you doubt this, just look carefully at the Home Finder magazine that frequently comes with the Sunday paper. Every time a property is near a trailer park, there is always, it's always prominently advertised. There's also a report by, by a city employee, employee that carefully references statistics that reveal up to 20% increase in property value for land that is near a park or trail. People buy into quality features, and that's why so many of our neighborhood and district plans protect these amenities. Whether you use them or not, a well-designed city that attracts and keeps people will have these facilities. Not convinced? Please know that there would be no point in having the more specific district or neighborhood plans unless they trump the comp plan. Now, I've heard that some may be confused or disbelieving as to the legality and the hierarchy of um, the comp plan and its adopted elements but they do have the weight of law behind them. And if you want me to find the reference, Mr. Robinson, about the ability to have gravel roads in the hillside area, we'd be glad to find that for you. Commissioner Robinson. Ms. Holmes, since we're on a friendly basis here, um, could you please explain to me, it seems to me that you're advocating uh, for a gravel road on the section of Greece, maybe, um, and I'm not, I didn't quite get what you were stating uh, in terms of what um, the petitioner's recommending uh, related to trails that, that you believe is not being done. Could you be more specific there, please? I'm, I'm advocating for that trail connection from Greece to Pyre Valley Road. As that, it's currently listed in the, in the recommendations. Right, whatever alignment they decide. Okay, thank yeah. you. As, but I, I brought up the issue of the gravel roads because uh, the, the past speaker mentioned the issue with that, and we made a very specific point in the Hillside District Plan, as you well know, to allow for certain conditions where there can still be gravel. And if that, if that makes better sense for the drainage issues, which I know they must have, then, you know, let it be an option. So that, that, that would be your testimony as it relates to Greece, uh, the cul-de-sac, the, the, the cul-de-sac ex extension? Just that part of it, yeah. Okay, thanks. And certainly I advocate for... Um, uh, for this, for Potter Highlands to become part of the Lursa immediately, and it makes a lot of sense to um, do it before, you know, so that they can maybe upgrade or at least improve what they destroyed during the construction. And that's pretty common, I think. 
Seeing no other comments, thank you for your testimony. I'm usually lowering this when I uh, come up. It's unusual. I'm John Weddleton, W-E-D-D-L-E-T-O-N, and I'm probably don't need five minutes, but I'm the chair of uh, HALO, so put me down for five in case I need it. And HALO wrote a letter in regards to the first case last year yeah, in support of the rezone, which is not relevant now, but also in support of the gravel trail separated from the road, and that is supported by the Hillside District Plan, which HALO um, came out in full support of. And further on that, there's a, a couple issues that I'd hope the petitioner would, would address. The new plat shows some minor differences from the one that we looked at last year. And one he did address where the new plat doesn't show the trails where we saw them last year. Also, the size of the large green belt is slightly larger on the current plat. And this little, you know, there, there's a little piece in the Y down below not shown on this map that was labeled in the previous one as a dedicated green belt, but is not now. And I just want to know if they're intending that to change or if it was just uh, um, it didn't show up on their map. The Regarding the trail away from the road, the Hillside District Plan does support trails away from road. It also supports gravel trails so that the nature trail proposed, um, the Hillside District Plan would recommend it be gravel if that's appropriate for the terrain. And in this case, we believe it is. Uh, regarding the trails, the trails along the alignments of Potter Valley Road and Potter Hearts, Heights Drive uh, appear to match recommended trails in the Hillside District Plan. The Hillside District Plan also shows a trail along the Dead End Road, which is now called Potter Highlands Road, that would collect, connect with e Eaglin Circle. These trails weren't just there because the roads happened to be there. These trails were carefully done in the Hillside District Plan to lead to the various neighborhoods and provide routes uphill into eventually uh, Trugas State Park. So it, it, they're not only relevant if there's a road platted there. The, uh, the, connection, the trail connection proposed between the cul-de-sac and Potter Valley Road we, we'd also support and is also supported by the Hillside District Plan Goal 10, which is to create good connections between neighborhoods. And I think the only issue there is you can see in some parts here, uh, right, right in this area, where it's a 20-foot wide walkway. So that makes for this 350-foot stretch proposed to be only 10 feet wide would be somewhat narrow given the terrain issues on the hillside. If it's fairly steep, you'd like the trail to move a little bit. 10 feet would limit that quite a bit. The, Mr. Robinson brought up an issue on gravel roads, and the Hillside District Plan is very explicit that if you have a road that would have less than 100 average daily traffic, a, uh, on it that you could do it with gravel. And I would expect in this case with six homes, and I think they say roughly 10 per home, it would they would be allowed to do gravel according to the Hillside District Plan. I wouldn't be here to recommend gravel or pavement. That's, I would leave that up to the developer. But if they chose to do gravel, it is supported by the Hillside District Plan. Uh, another point Mr. Robinson brought up is that this variance would effectively amend the Hillside District Plan, and I don't quite understand that view. The Hillside District Plan is clear. Given that we live on steep slopes, you have to have some leeway in making changes to standard municipal procedures. So this variance is being done largely to prevent the steeper slope on the road, and that's something I think would be allowed in the Hillside District Plan. So that's the gist of my comments. I have them written up, and I'll pass them out to you. Some of them written up. Thank you for your testimony. Do you have any questions? I have no questions. Any other public testimony? Mr. Grenier, you have four minutes and 19 seconds, I believe, or nine seconds. Four minutes and nine seconds remaining. Nine seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. couple points I'd like to, to make is, uh, first off, the drainage off of the cul-de-sac would not head north, it would head south. Uh, and that was one of the topographic features we looked at. We did not want to impact any of the existing 
improvements. So this will drain down in this direction and then we'll, we will have a, uh, a drainage feature, uh, riprap type of swale uh, in connection with a, a rock filled infiltration gallery which will uh, capture the water and then an overflow that will come down towards Potter Valley Road. So uh, as far as drainage, uh, we wanted to make sure we weren't impacting the existing Grease Drive. And so we, we're, the drainage is actually going away from Grease, not towards it. The second uh, point, Potter uh, Highlands is part of ARDSA. Uh, the points that have been made that uh, this is tying into ARDSA, uh, we would be willing to accept the um, uh, at least to try and an annex, there's quite a process that you go through. It takes quite a while, but we would, we would be open to making that uh, that application to uh, annex that into the the local ARTSA. Getting it out of ARTSA is a process that we're not really familiar with, so that's um, that's going to be tough. It might be easier to go the other way to. Uh, to, in, uh, to annex a part of uh, Paradise Valley, which uh, become, would be part of the arts. So we'd like to explore that and we're open to that. Um, Potter Valley Road, I, I, I think everyone is, is under the, uh, well, let me, let me just say Potter Valley Road will be paved. It is, will be a paved road. And, uh, Second point I'd like to make is there is there is a trail along uh, this section of the road. The reason we didn't show it, it's within the dedication. I highlighted the section that's detached out of the tracks or out of uh, the dedications. But there is a trail, and that was one of the conditions. I'm sorry. This there was the condition to to build that trail uh, in that section of road. Grease Drive is 1,700 feet long in its current configuration, and then uh, the cul-de-sac we're looking at is an additional 350. Those are the points I uh, wanted to make, and be happy to answer any other questions. Do we have any questions, Mr. Deans? Uh, through the chair, my question is related to Tract A4A, and. You know, it's a fairly good-sized tract. It's not going to be developed because it's very steep. Is that correct? Yes, that was the other point. In fact, I circled it on here. It is an open space tract as well. Okay. It, um, and in fact, we in looking at this, uh, I think we'll connect the two. Um, but right now, we we just showed it as two separate tracks. But the intent and under the uh, original approval is that that is an open space tract. Okay, and does it connect to, you know, there is a section line easement, so theoretically it would connect to Grease Drive also, correct? Through that section line easement? Are we talking in this, this area right here? Yes. And the question is, I'm sorry. It, 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 would that be considered a trail easement at that point too? Yes, that could be an access point for a trail. Okay, and then also going to the north, I guess it would be, to England? On the Paradise Valley side, it says that it's got a 20-foot wide walkway. Yes, and plus there's the section line easement, as you point out. Okay. And so that is used. that could be used for access. So there's a fair amount of connectivity already. There is a lot of connectivity. Okay, and then... Um, you know, we talked about the, the gravel drive on Greece. Um, right now, Greece would be paved, your section. Your our, section. Our section, that is correct, would be paved. That was one of the, yes, we're, we're planning to pave that section. Okay, how do you feel about, you know, the neighbors suggesting that, it's, it, that it be gravel? We'd have to go back to the I know it's the design criteria manual probably told you that you had to pave it. There's there's the dilemma. You've got the design criteria manual versus the hillside district plan, and the position at this point of of the municipality and the staff is the DCM holds the design criteria, 
and so that that creates some some issues uh, when we were working on the road grade um, challenge they kept going back to the DCM and basically the hillside district plan did not hold as much um, credence to them from that standpoint when we we're working on the engineering side and, so, and there's also there's also some conflicts between the DCM and the hillside district plan we've brought this up to staff on this particular issue and so I think you'll be seeing some um, some amendments some proposed amendments coming forward that address those those uh, those differences uh, but right now you're caught in the middle, though, sounds like, that you're not capable of making that change to gravel. Quite honestly, we haven't asked that question on this particular uh, cul-de-sac. When it came to the overall project, it was, there was no, um, no option. It, was, it came across as being paved. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have uh, several comments. I uh, just wanted to get them in um, before Mr. Grenier uh, sat down. Um, so first of all, just to you know, bring us back to what's before the commission, uh, try and bring some clarity to some of the questions that have been raised. Um, uh, first of all, uh, this is uh, the request tonight is uh, an amendment to an already approved plat. So they've already got an approved plat. Um, all that the petitioner is seeking is to reconfigure um, six of the lots and, uh, of course, this change in the direction of the cul-de-sac, whether it go up from Potter Valley or down from Greece. So that's the only thing that's before uh, the commission tonight. Uh, all the other previously approved conditions of approval that affect all the rest of the subdivision hold. Nothing changes. They, I think the petitioner was seeking not to open up the entire subdivision to any changes, but just to deal with this one small section, um, get approval for this variance, essentially, and get out. They just want approval for the variance uh, of the length of the cul-de-sac width, and then uh, and that's it. Um, uh, in regards to just uh, for the for information for the commission. Um, the subdivision regulations uh, require um, uh, require uh, the subdivider to improve right of way uh, when it is internal to the subdivision, but when the the, the right of way is external or peripheral um, to the subdivision, then it is um, uh, it's not mandatory. It is um, I've lost the word. Um, uh, it, it turns from a shall to a may. So the planning authority may require the improvement for peripheral streets when it finds that they are necessary and efficient for the flow of traffic uh, for emergency vehicle access. So um, subdivision regulations 2185-070 uh, uh, access streets, peripheral streets. So just to make a clear distinction between roads that are internal to a subdivision must be built, one's external, um, it's up to uh, uh, the commission. Um, and it's decided uh, often on uh, uh, proportionality. And, uh, you know, Grease Drive is long enough that it's, you know, it's, it's quite a long road and it's peripheral, so it, it's not a shall. The, the, the subdivider is not required to improve it. It's a may. Um, and they haven't proposed to make that improvement. And uh, um, the traffic department, private development haven't uh, uh, requested that to be improved. Um, the... Um, one condition that it sounded like the petitioner was open to, and you can ask him about this, is, is a condition stating uh, the petitioner, uh, see, um, uh, the subdivision shall annex into the Grease Drive um, a limited road service area. Um, those, that phrase, that, that a new condition stating uh, this subdivision shall annex in, or petition to annex into the Grease Drive limited road service area would help address one of the concerns raised by community. And it seemed like the petitioner was open to that. Uh, I can go through that wording one more time if you like. Um, and then uh, in regards to the, Lori Skinky to my left, the uh, uh, non-motorized transportation coordinator. She said um, that the wording proposed by um, the petitioner for the condition, so, so the petitioner proposed to get rid of conditions three and four to delete those and replace them with the wording that he handed uh, to the chair. Um, staff agrees with that wording. Um, the, uh, Lori Skinky suggested that um, they add um, uh, three words to the end of that, which would um, address um, her concern about 
um, being too fuzzy about the the uh, the improvement of 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 the of the trail. So she suggested, um, as approved by uh, case S one one eight six four dash one. That's the previous case. The petitioner wants to build um, the uh, the trail at the same level. Um, as uh, the trail throughout the subdivision. And uh, so he wants that. Um, Lori Skanky wants that. It, this would be achieved just by adding the words um, uh, to the end of what was proposed by the petitioner as approved by case S11864-1, S11 the previous, uh, previously approved plat. Um, I have one question for the petitioner, and, and then I'll be finished. Um, I just wanted him to clarify that the, the, proposed, the trail that he's proposing um, will be separate from the drainage feature. Through the chair, yes, it will be. It'll be separate. As far as the annexation uh, condition, if I may, I'm, I'm reluctant to agree to that. The, the process, because we're in uh, Larsa and in Ar uh, Artsa, we're not really sure what that process would be and what the what the outcome would be. I, w I would be reluctant at this time without understanding it. We we can explore, but uh, we Commissioner won't. Robinson, oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Robinson. Thanks. I, I mean, I appreciate what staff said in terms of we're not opening up, you know, what has previously been approved. I mean, that said, we we just open it all up because we've changed the the whole way this thing was oriented. I mean, right now, what you have is you have six homes that pay into Ardsa, yet don't pay anything on the road that they live off of, right? Meanwhile, you have a whole bunch of people people that live off of Greece Drive that don't pay anything on Ardsa but pay on Greece Drive. I mean, you have this sort of goofy situation that is totally, you know, commonplace on the hillside because of it, and we're actually making it worse. So I don't, I don't, know, the, I don't know what the solution is. I mean, the, probably if you looked at someone's mill levy, the people in these six lots are paying more for roads, right, than anybody else that's paying into the Lursa. And I, and, as an aside, I finally found somebody on the hillside that's actually going to pay, join me in paying for Golden View Drive as a non-hillside resident. But the, 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 the point is, I don't know how to reconcile. We can, we can suggest it. It's still got to be a vote. There's nothing we can do to ensure that that actually happens, to be, you know, amend the ARDSA, everybody in ARDSA has to vote, to amend the LURSA, everybody in the LURSA has to vote. So there's nothing we can do other than to make a suggestion. I guess what I would say is is that there needs to be some kind of practical situation that somebody here that's utilizing the road on a daily basis and during construction has some sort of, um, you know, from a fairness standpoint, some sort of, and I'm by no means suggesting that they have to pave the whole road. I'm just saying even from a snow removal standpoint, from a drainage standpoint, any of that stuff, they're totally off the hook. and so you can see how the neighborhood is sort of concerned. So I wonder if staff or the petitioner or anybody have a recommendation on how we take this relatively simple situation in front of us that I think we're all okay with and, and, and get ourselves, you know, out of it so that we can, we can move on tonight. Uh, through the chair, uh, Mr. Ferguson, what was commonly done with plats, um, and there are many examples of this, for instance, in uh, Bear Valley, that um, the, there's a condition added, and it may be on the previous plat. I don't have that information in front of me. What's commonly done with plats is uh, a condition is, is requested or, or approved that says um, uh, uh, the condition states, quote, um, request um, uh, either submit a petition uh, to annex into uh, the Greece Drive uh, uh, LURSA or uh, request to petition into, but, but if they weren't accepted, then they're not, they're, it's not, it's, it's basically becomes a suggestion that they, um, they seek to join the LURSA. Um, to the question of LURSA versus ARTSA, um, you have me there. I'd leave that to Mr. Grenier. Um, I'm trying to get to the, the issue. Do you have any idea what the mill rate would be if you were annexed into Larissa? Through the chair, no, sir. I don't have that information with me. Does the staff have any idea what the mill rate would be? No, sir. Thank you. Did you have any more comments? You're still in the queue. Uh, no, thank you. 
Commissioner Proof? Yeah, I, I'd just like to recommend that uh, to, uh, to help alleviate the concerns of during construction, obviously a, a uh, prior, prior site uh, inspection and videotaping of the road going into prior to construction with the contractor, whoever that is, and then post-construction and the differences, uh, you know, you can hold a contractor responsible for that. And I think that would help mitigate some of the issues with the neighbors. Um, so you have a before and after. So just as a suggestion. Through the chair, we've, we've entered those types of agreements before. In fact, in, under the subdivision agreement, uh, we can, we can uh, handle that. Thank you. Any other questions? Got one more. Commissioner Thank you. Um, uh, through the chair, my question is we were just discussing that particular issue with the road potentially for Grease Drive. Um, how should we word that? Um, and I, I'm directing it at the petitioner but also at staff. Um, how should we word that so that it makes it make sense? I, I know that in the past it's happened in different neighborhoods, you know, like if there's construction happening, whether it's an existing neighborhood or not, you know, that the, the, the road is surveyed to see the condition of it, and then afterwards they survey again and bring it up to whatever standard it was prior to construction. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, uh, it could be uh, resolved with private development. Um, uh, the revol Resolve with private development um, uh, a pre and post inspection for um, Grease Drive. Um, the petitioner does not have a uh, subdivision agreement uh, with uh, private development yet. He'll probably start getting to work on that, you know, tomorrow. And um, uh, this can, as Mr. Grenier said, it can be uh, come part of the subdivision agreement, which which isn't isn't written yet. Is that something that we should be concerned with tonight with our conditions? Um, you know, I, I don't know. Mr. Grenier um, uh, works with private development all the time. Uh, maybe he could respond. That'd be a fairly common, uh, it'd be called a special provision underneath the subdivision agreement, and it could be added as a, a pre and post uh, inspection uh, that a pre and post inspection of the existing uh, uh, road conditions. Did you have any other comments? Any other questions? Hearing none, we're going to close the public hearing. And individuals may have the right to appeal. Oops. Oh, after we've, okay, let's pull first. Okay. So, okay, so the first one we're going to hear is, okay, the first uh, one that we'll have is for the approval of the request of the variance, if we got to have a motion for that. Uh, through the chair, I uh, move to approve S11864-2. Potter Highlands subdivision, lots 1 through 11, block 1, lots 1 through 6, block 2, lots 1 through 9, block 3, lots 1 through 4, block 4, and tracks A4A, A4B, A4C, and B3. I move to approve the request for a variance from AMC 21.80.240, the design standards cul-de-sac, subject to one, a recording is suitable plat within 18 months of its approval. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. Okay. Yeah. I'm not really sure now. Are we taking this one? Okay, and that's what she's done, so we'll take a vote on that. We'll open it up for any comments, and we'll take a vote on that. Okay. Anybody, anyone want to speak to that? This um, cul-de-sac is very common. This style and type and depth is very common on the hillside. It's uh, not incredibly uh, different than what exists right now. Yeah. Yeah, she's pointing them out to her, I think. Okay. 
it meets the standard. Okay. I'll add, I'll add a couple comments to it that the, uh, that the, uh, the substantive standards have been met of one, conditions one, two, three, and four have been met. Um, those are on pages. Uh, look here. I believe seven and eight. And uh, so, so anyway, this, the, based on the uh, staff recommendation, so these these amendments have been met. Do you want me going to, into the recommendations? Uh, okay. All right. Any other uh, discussion on this motion? No, oh, no discussion. And uh, is there anyone? Uh, yeah, who, who would want take exception? T take exception? This uh, motion passes. Now what we'll do is we'll address the motion to make amendments to the S11864-1 uh, preliminary plat as previously approved by Planning and Zoning Commission on June 6, subject to those issues. Mr. Dean. In the matter of S11864-2, I move to approve the request for amendments to a preliminary plat. Uh, that case number was S11864-1, previously approved by Planning and Zoning Commission on June 6, 2011. Um, I move to approve items number B1, resolving utility easements, B2, updating current subdivision agreement 12-005 to reflect the approved changes. Uh, number three, I would like to use the language that the petitioner has provided, and if the secretary would be kind enough to read that in. The language provided by the petitioner was for condition three, Dedicate a 10-foot right-of-way and construct an unpaved trail from Grease Drive to the detached unpaved trail along Potter Valley Road. The constructed trail shall have same level of improvement and width as the detached trail along Potter Valley Road. I would like to add uh, to that statement, um, as approved by um, Case S11864-1, uh, which was the previous case, I would like to uh, delete a number four. Um, and then the second one uh, is number, f there was two number fours. I'd like to make that number, that second number four, a number f uh, four. And I would also like to add two amendments. And I didn't know if you would like to vote on this and then look at two additional amendments or go ahead and put them in. Okay. Um, and point, just a quick point of order. Um, you can put this motion forward and then have each of the amendments addressed separately or if you're going to put them all in the same motion with all of the changes. Um, separately. And I just wanted to be clear which way you were wanting to do it because you mentioned amendment. So I'd like to go ahead and put it all together in one. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, number five, um, or number four actually, would be making the following drafting changes on the final plat, renaming proposed Potter Ridge Drive to Potter Highlands Drive, and B, renaming proposed Greek Drive to Greek Circle, along with number would this be number five or number six? Five. Five, okay. Um, I'd like to add the following language. Um, resolve through the subdivision agreement the petitioner's responsibility to fix any damage to grease drive that occurs during construction. And last, um, I would like to add another um, recommendation that the petitioner submit a petition for the six lots of the subdivision on Grease Drive to be able to annex into the Grease Drive LRSA. Any discussion? 
Commissioner Robinson. I'll, I'll be supporting the motion as stated. I think uh, the uh, um, additional language at the end, while it strikes me as a little bit unfair for the six homes, given that they're both in Ardsa and the Lursa, um, frankly, it's the only neighborly thing for them to do is to be added to the Lursa of this road. Um, I'd also just state that the uh, amended plat um, uh, and tr proposed trail connections as well as the way that the trails are designed to be unpaved are consistent with uh, both the Hillside District Plan and public testimony that we've heard tonight. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. And so, well, I guess, is there anyone opposed? No one opposed? It passes unanimously. And uh, I got to get to that. Any individual having uh, may have appeal rights relating to any action the Planning and Zoning Commission takes. Appeals must be filed with the clerk's office within 20 days after the Planning and Zoning Commission's final decision. We thank you for the thank you for your participation. And uh, I guess do we bring the Just go to reports. No, see no reports, so I have a motion for adjournment. All right, I see uh, we have any, anyone have anything reports at all? Seeing none, I would take a motion to uh, adjourn. And seconded, we're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>